some stuff done here. So, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. We just finished the introduction of these guys that are going to serve the church. Okay? We might call the first deacons of the church. Um, and they're the laying on of hands, they're receiving the power, the grace of God. And in verse 8, chapter 6, verse 8, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verse 8, here we go. And Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And I'm not going to say a lot to him, I try not to because I no, don't no feel well, but also we got to cover some ground. So, Carrie, go ahead. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. What's the sound like? Yeah, it's the trial of our Lord, right? They didn't quite the same old nonsense. Okay, and so there's two attacks against him. First of all, that he speaks against the law and he speaks against the temple, right? And it's also bringing forward that, that repetition we've seen over and over again about the destruction of the temple, okay, being brought forth again. So, um, so Stephen's going to give an answer to them. Okay, and uh, sorry, Carrie, I cut you off. Why don't you just finish the next couple verses there? And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Okay, now I'm going to launch into his whole thing, which you guys hopefully have read. His whole long tirade, uh, tirade, whatever. What is it? What does he give? Salvation. He gives salvation history. Yeah, so close your Bibles. <laughs> We're going to go without Stephen real quick. We have a little fun here. Um, but before, before I... Come on, Carrie, close your Bible. And, uh, and um, I want to ask you, though, everyone saw his face was like that of an angel. And yet, they end up doing what to him? No, no, no. Yeah, How could they do that? saw his face was like that of an angel. When did they just realize that, hey, they're on the wrong side of the game here? They look like, they look like angels now. Why not? So that's not really scary. Well, but he looks like an angel. Are angels scary? Well, they might not be seen with the same eyes as others are seen. Ah, exactly. St. John Chrysostom, you're in good company. Says. Can't see color. Oh, okay. <laughs> It was, uh, it was grace, it was the glory of Moses, I think, that God clothed him in his splendor because perhaps he had something to say. And in order that his very appearance would strike terror into them, for it is possible, very possible, for figures full of heavenly grace to be attractive to friendly eyes and terrifying to the eyes of the enemy. Okay? There's another uh, thought that um, I had when I, was, when I was reading that, that... You know, in the Garden of Eden, Eve goes and speaks with the serpent. We have to think, well, I mean, the book of Revelation, the serpent is described as a dragon. Well, why was she even willing to go and speak with the, with the devil? Unless he has the ability somehow to possibly change his appearance to make himself uh, attractive to some and make others terrified of him. Possibly Adam seen him in a way that Adam would have backed off and not intervened. Okay? And also similarly in our lives, I think that happens, that, that the powers of darkness can be attracted to it. They are presented in a very attractive manner in some, sometimes to us. So we have that ability to, in the spiritual world to shift back and forth the appearance, and the eyes of the one beholding has a lot to do with it. Who's seen it? Okay? As you were saying, it's possible that to those who didn't have the eyes of faith, seeing the face of an angel was actually terrifying to them. Okay? It wasn't something beautiful to come Okay, So he goes through this whole, he says, you want an answer? 
You want to understand what I'm preaching? Let me start in the beginning. And he works his way all through salvation history. Why would he do that? Well, they're familiar with it, but won't, don't you think they'd be like sitting there going, all right, yes, we know Moses, we know so-and-so. Why would he do that? We're going to look at that because he places Jesus Christ in the story of all of these Old Testament prophets. He just keeps right on going into Christ. So he begins in the beginning and starts building his momentum, and he says, look, it just keeps on going, and here's the next one. But we're going to look at some aspects of salvation history, the way he describes it, that really condemns the guys that are before him for rejecting Jesus Christ. But before we do that, let's just do a quick salvation history tour, so we don't have to read it. You tell me, what are the main, give me the main events of salvation history. The first major event of salvation history is? Creation. Yeah, creation. Yeah, he goes with Abraham, but that's okay. Creation. What's next? The fall. All right, we can put the fall. Okay, we put the fall in there. How about that? Not that the fall's not important, but I mean, no, no, it's just a creation narrative, right? Creation, the fall's all the thing. Okay. Abraham, you choose somebody. Yeah, before Abraham, what? No. Yeah, Noah and the flood. Okay, what's next? That's better. Yeah, Abraham and um, what event in Abraham's life? Yeah, are we just, oh, that's all in Abraham. Okay, fine. What's next? Isaac. 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 All right. No, I mean, a major event in the Joseph. story. Joseph. Joseph. Okay, it's selling Joseph into slavery, the whole story of the Exodus, right? Which is part of that, selling him into slavery, the end of Genesis, the beginning of Exodus, and all that whole story. What's the next major event? Right? This can cover their going out and coming back in. What's the next? Desert. All, all the 40 years in the desert. Yeah, but that's part of that. That's part of that. Come on, guys. you got to get past that. This is all stuff familiar to you. So we got to get into that questionable area now. What happens after the Exodus? The kingdom. Kingdoms. Yeah, okay, the time of the kings. Okay, the setting up of the kingdom, kingdom of David. What's next? What bad event? Yeah, the Babylonian exile. And what event brings that on? Babylonian exile. What happens? What great sin among the people? Way before the Babylonian exile. Remember the civil war? The north and the south? The split in the Samaritan nation of the north. Right, okay, so you have the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Fine. And then you get the return from that exile return, okay? And then what are we going to say next? Uh, maybe we'll just put Christ. Coming to Christ. That's a huge trip, but that's okay. All right, you can give me my people. And don't, I don't want to hear the same people talking here. Some of you other people in there are talking. Adam and Eve. All right, Adam and Eve. Who's next? No, no. Dad. All right, fine. Go on. Who's next? Abraham. Abraham. Right. Isaac. Isaac. Jacob. Who's next? Joseph. Okay, are the 12 tribes, right? Who receives the uh, blessing? Uh, of the, out of the 12 brothers. Judah. Judah. Right? And the line of Judah will become the line of the kings, right? All right? Moses. Moses. And who brings them into the promised land? Joshua. Okay. Time of the kings. Well, you got, remember what happens in between the time of the kings and, the, and this? The judges. The, yeah, the judges. You get all those great judges, right? And then finally, King. Who's the first king of Israel? Saul. Saul. <laughs> who's the first king of Israel, Carrie? David. David. Who's the first king of Israel? Saul. S A U T. Who's the first king of Israel? Trick question. Yeah. God. God's the first king of Israel. Remember, when they asked for a king, God says, "Don't worry, Samuel. They haven't rejected you as ruler over them. They rejected me as king." All right. So, okay, but all right, fine, David, okay. Okay, who's next? Solomon. Solomon's a very important, okay, Solomon, his son. Okay, who's the next major person you got to know? If, if any of you guys are lost right now, who's lost? 
Okay, don't admit it. Uh, we're going to, right after Christmas, we're going to do our salvation history thing again, right? Just refresh our memory so we go through all that stuff. And we're going to go through a lot faster this time. You're a bit All right, David and Solomon. And then, what major figure? Who's Solomon's son? Jeroboam. Not Jeroboam. Rehoboam. All right. Rehoboam. Rehoboam. Why is Rehoboam? Oh, whatever. Why is Rehoboam important? He lost the kingdom. Yeah, he's the one that causes the civil war to take place because he raises taxes and all that stuff. He's very hard on the people. Right? Jeroboam takes the people up north. Rehoboam takes the people in the south. Right? And two kingdoms are established. Eventually, who comes in from the north to destroy the northern kingdom? Assyria. The Assyrians. And don't answer this next question. Who comes in to destroy the southern kingdom? Babylonians. Yeah, the Babylonians. Good. So the Babylonians destroy the kingdom of Judah in the south where Jerusalem is. And they take them into exile. And then what nation rises to power? It's going to free them. The Persians. And what king among the Persians frees them? Cyrus. 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 Writes the edict to free them. Okay? And find who do we get in between these? What we get some some, some of the prophets. We also get Nehemiah and Ezra. Or Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, and let's see, what other what other thing takes place? Remember, they're under the rulership of the Persians and then eventually under the rulership of the, uh, the Greeks, right? Remember that? The Greek Empire breaks apart. Stay with me. We're almost done. And they're controlled by some bad guys after that split. Okay, after the, after the Greek Empire breaks apart. And what... Dynasty rises to power among Israel. Well, the Maccabees. The Maccabees. The Maccabees. Okay, I'll just put Mac. The Maccabees. Okay, and it's after the Maccabees then that Christ comes, and then we get too much of that. So fine, there's salvation history. That's the whole Old Testament. We couldn't have done that before we did a salvation history series together, guys. So okay, open back up to Acts. <coughs> I want you to notice something about the way that, that um, St. Stephen interprets salvation history. Over and over again, when you look at chapter 7, he starts out, he starts telling the story, and he gets to it. In verse 9, he's talking about Abraham and the selling of Joseph. He says, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? No, not at all. Look at verse 27. Story of Moses. When Moses was going to stand up for his people, he says, verse uh, 27, But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of So the people of Israel cast Moses out. Okay, uh, again in verse 39, again about Moses. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. Okay, in the major parts of salvation history, Luke is writing about, and Stephen is talking about the major figures, the patriarchs of Israel, that when God sends people to them, they cast him aside. Okay, so they they challenge Stephen and say, "This man is blaspheming God. He's speaking against the law and he's speaking against Moses." And what does he respond with? Our fathers were the ones. You want to talk about the people that spoke against Moses and spoke against the law? Those are our ancestors. Those are our fathers. The ones you hold up in honor. Those are the ones that refuse to follow God, not me. Okay. Um, again, in verse uh, in verse fifty three, in verse fifty three, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. 
Okay, so they say they're they're accusing him of not following the law, and what does he respond with? It's not me. It's you who receive the law and don't keep it. Okay. Um, in verse fifty-two, similarly, just one verse back. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Okay, so he says you rejected the law, you rejected the prophets. And finally, continuing that same sentence, and they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. So, so he responds by saying, look, you people are accusing me of breaking the law. You broke the law. You don't follow the prophets. And you refuse Jesus Christ, whom God has sent to you. You're the ones that are the murderers. You're the ones that are the killers. Far from backing down, he goes for their throat. And that's probably one of the reasons why he ends up getting stoned. Okay? So he responds, and not only that, he responds in a very interesting manner. He doesn't fully say, look, I have a saying about the temple. What's he say? What's he say about the temple? They accuse him. They say, look, you've been speaking against the temple. And what's his response? Verse 49, again. Verse 49. The heavens are my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house can you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is to be my resting place? Do not my hands make all these things? Okay, so what's he say about the temple? He says, yeah, he says, look, God in the prophet Isaiah already told us that this thing you have built is ultimately not his final dwelling place. It's ultimately not his home. And that phrase they're taken from Isaiah, um, uh, where is it? Oh, in verse 48, we skipped it, sorry. Yet the Most High the most high does not dwell in houses made with hands. Okay, that phrase, made with hands, comes in the Old Testament three or four times, and it's always in reference to the making of an idol. Okay, and so he, in, in kind of veiled language, accuses those who have just built this temple of building an idol for themselves. And in fact, some ways, in some ways, they have in the way they're treating it. Okay, so he kind of turns the whole argument on its head. Another aspect that we need to know is that as he goes through his response, as he tells the story of salvation history, he says, "Look." Our people came from Mesopotamia. Who came from Mesopotamia? Abraham. Abraham, right? And he goes up to Haran, and then he comes down from Haran. He says they came from Egypt. They came from the Red Sea. He points out all of these places outside of Israel where the people are being called from. Okay, and in fact, that's exactly what the early Christians are doing. They're taking in all of these people from outside of Judea and entering them into the house of God. Okay? So, Tina, we know he yeah. was divinely inspired, but would they have been shocked that Stephen knew this? If they didn't know that he had to give the Holy Spirit and the wisdom and all that. No, he had known known uh, salvation history from his background, would, would they have been shocked to hear his knowledge? Oh, no, I don't think so. It's, it's warm in here. What little skits keep on? Yeah, I know. It's probably it's uh, I don't think so, because I think the question you're asking is, like, we're kind of shocked that we would be expected to know that knowledge, right? Like, seriously, in, among our group, for the most part, we're not totally confused by what I just did. And in most Catholic churches in the United States, People will be totally confused about what I just did. Really? Right? I mean, well, before we did our salvation history series, or before we were attending Bible studies all the time talking about this on a constant basis. My, my point is, just, yeah. the apostles were fishermen, so they weren't the ones who were steeped in the, I wouldn't think they were steeped in the... I, I'd say maybe in the style of his response, he's able to stand before the judges and give a, give a cogent response, and that might be true. But at the same time, these are men that are so dedicated... To the, to the scriptures, that they're able to quote him. He doesn't have a Bible in front of him. And he's quoting Isaiah. He's making references to Jeremiah. He knows the scriptures at hand. And that is, he is inspired by God. You know, as you stand before judges, don't worry about what you're going to say. 
But at the same time, these people were able to do that. They were able to sit there. I hope even in our own lives, as we're studying the scriptures more and more together, that that's happening maybe even in your own life. That things are clicking in our daily lives that are making reference to the thing I'm reading in Acts of the Apostles. Like, okay, this is, you know, and that's, I think, what's going on for him. He's been studying these things, and he realizes what's taking place before him. So, you know, I don't know if that's it. An odd question. Go ahead. Do you think that the people of the Egyptian Israel now, or Jews anywhere, are aware of this question? They're studying it by the In the Old Testament, you mean? Sure. Well, I know there's a lot of secular Jews that aren't studying the scriptures. You know, there's a, there's, that's a huge thing. There's also a lot of very conservative Jews that are studying the Old Testament and know the scriptures very well. So, you know, we got to also realize that they weren't, they didn't have this in front of them, right? They were being told from their childhood. They were memorizing the text from childhood, handing that on. So memorization for the Jews was extremely important. Okay, um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay, all right. Um, verse 51. What you, chapter are you in now? Oh, sorry, chapter 7. Chapter 7. Verse 51. First of all, he, what, he just quoted Isaiah. Okay, he just quoted Isaiah. And then he says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Okay, that uncircumcision of the heart comes from the prophet Jeremiah. Okay, in fact, we can turn there real quick. I'm not, I don't have a note that I'm supposed to turn there with you, but why not? Let's just take a look at it. Just in case. Um, Jeremiah chapter 9. Remember, oh yeah, this is, uh, I'm good, I'm glad I did it. Uh, remember, when you're reading these texts, and you got that footnote to the Old Testament text, go back and at least read the paragraph, right? It'd be extremely helpful. Verse 25, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 25. Behold, the days are coming. Go ahead, Carrie. When I will attend to all those who are circumcised only in the four cities, Egypt, Judah, Edom, the Ammonites, Moab, and all those with shaven temples who live in the desert. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. Okay, so he, he uses this reference from Jeremiah, and he's also just quoted Isaiah against the people, against the rulers of Israel. And what's that mean? When is Jeremiah writing? Do you remember? Or when was Isaiah writing? What time period? Take a guess. Who, who pasted my whole thing in the back of their Bible? Oh, yeah. <laughs> did you, Nina? Oh, yeah, I did. Oh, sweet. Okay. <laughs> come on, take it. When did the prophets, when did most of the prophets come? During Judah. During the, during the break, right? During the Civil War. And just before or just during the time of the Babylonian exile, most of the prophets were preaching right at that time of the Babylonian exile. In fact, many of them went into exile with Israel and were writing during the exile itself. So let's read that thing again. Behold, the days are coming. Okay? Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, but I will punish all those who are circumcised, but yet uncircumcised. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, that cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. Stephen quotes this text and says, he was writing about you. You're the ones that are uncircumcised in heart. And guess what's going to happen to you? The Babylonian exile. A nation's going to come in and destroy you if you continue in your ways. By quoting Jeremiah and applying it to them, he applies the whole historical situation that's taking place. Okay? Go back to Acts. We'll read from verse 
verse 51, just because it's a great, uh, we just quoted Isaiah, we've just been looking at those verses. This is, this is Stephen, now, finishing his quotation of Isaiah, finishing his whole, his whole uh, background in the Old Testament, and he turns right to the rulers, right to the people that are accusing him, this is what he says. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did, your, did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Okay, so he just goes for the jugular. I mean, of course they're going to kill him, right? Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth against him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of, the, of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Hmm. Who else said that? Who else said something similar to that? Christ did. Yeah, what did he say? You see the heavens open and the Son of Man. Yeah, see the, see the right hand of the Father, right? And when was it? Did he, he say that? He said it to... Nathaniel. Right, right, yeah. Didn't he say during, during his, during, his uh, during the judgment too in the temple? Oh, that's during what I was thinking. The fall of Jerusalem. What's that? Didn't he say during the prediction of the fall of Jerusalem? He might have. Look that up for me. <laughs> Anyways, so he has this he has this vision. What vision is it from the Old Testament? What vision is it? Look at your footnotes, it's right there. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man stand at the right hand of God. Look, there's quotation marks around it. Look down at your footnote. Is it your footnote or not? No. Oh, she is. <laughs> Turn to Daniel. It's a reference to Daniel, chapter 7. Daniel, chapter 7. Does some of you have a footnote there? Yes, Daniel. 7. Good. <laughs> Daniel, chapter 7. I think this will be instructive for us. So you guys got to go back. Whenever you see a footnote, you got to go back if possible. Unfortunately, I don't know why Ignatius didn't have it there for you. But. Mine has a uh, reference to Mark 14. Yeah, to Mark 14, which is where Christ is. You, and you watch. You go to Mark 14, I'll have a footnote to Daniel. Mark 14. But don't go to Mark 14 right now. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Sorry. Daniel chapter 7. Here we go. You're there? All right. Verse 11. Daniel chapter 7, verse 11. Nina, go ahead. I watched then from the first of the arrogant words which the horn spoke until the beast was slain and his body thrown into the fire to be burned up. The other beasts, which also lost their dominion, were granted a prolongation of life for a time and a season. Yeah. What's that sound like? Yeah, that's right, man. Yeah, what's it? <laughs> what other book of the Bible does that sound like? Some beasts and some. Revelation. Yeah, the book of Revelation. Because in the book of Revelation, John's making reference to Daniel. Okay, so go ahead. As the visions during the night continued, I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. When he reached the ancient one and was presented before him, he received dominion, glory, and kingship. Nations and peoples of every language serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be taken away. His kingship shall not be destroyed. Keep going. I, Daniel, found my spirit in anguish within a sheath of flesh, and I was terrified by the visions of my mind. I approached one of those present and asked him what all this meant in truth. In answer, he made known to me the meaning of the things. These four great beasts stand for four kingdoms which shall arise on the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingship to possess it forever and ever. Okay. So, reading that text in, and placing it in what's going on in Acts, look back again at verse 13. I saw and behold, the clouds of the heaven came, and it was like this, one like the Son of Man. That's the reference that he's saying. He looks up in the sky, he's in the clouds part, right? And he sees one like the Son of Man in heaven, and he can't, comes to the Ancient of Days, and what happens? He receives dominion. 
Who, what kind of man receives dominion? A king. He's the Christ. Okay? He receives dominion and glory and, uh, and, and kingdom. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Again, back to Acts and Pentecost. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. What's going to happen to the other kings? Yeah. yeah. Their dominion, their kingship is being removed from them and it is be- being given to Christ and to his saints, to the holy ones. And so St. Stephen is standing before them and he declares this vision of what he sees and the Jews know that when that takes place, the rulers that are ruling them in that day, not only the Jews... But he's standing before the the rulers of the Jews, the Sanhedrin. Their dominion and their power is going to be ripped out of their hands. They're the ones that are going to lose power. And it's going to be given to the holy ones. Okay, Not only is Jesus made king, but the kingdom is given to the holy ones. They are the ones given dominion. Okay, so go back to Acts again. Chapter 7, verse 57. Go ahead, Nina. But they cried out in a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed upon him together. They threw him out of the city and began to stone him. The witnesses laid down their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Okay. There's a couple things that, um, a couple parallels. We started out looking at this whole situation with Stephen, and the accusations against him are a false witness, okay? A false witness about the destruction of the temple, similar to what? Have we said, right? To Christ. Uh, I have your yeah. context first. It's in two places in Matthew. Yeah. The first one, he's predicting the end of the world, and the second one, where he's being accused before the Sanhedrin, all the false witnesses are coming before him. Good. So it's the exact same situation, yeah. right? And the exact same time, he pulls that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't Nathaniel, right? Also Nathaniel. That's, that's also Nathaniel, okay. Okay, anyway, so that's nice. That's a point you go look that up at home. I mean, forget turning on the stupid television, there it is. I mean, anyways. Okay, I'm going to stop it. I don't have one, so there's nothing to like. <laughs> okay. There's reports that Jesus will destroy the temple. Similar accusation, right? Jesus talks about the vision of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Stephen has that vision. His prayer, which he offers to God. In fact, did we even get to that? Yeah, we got to that. Is there a parallel there between Christ and Stephen? Yeah. What's the parallel? Yeah, he says, forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. So you see this parallel between Stephen and his Lord. And following upon what we've been talking about in Acts of the Apostles, what's going on? I think it's accidental. Maybe Luke's just trying to make him look kind of like, well, it's nice, it's like Jesus. What's going on there? We've been looking at all through Acts about what's taking place in the hearts of these men. They're being transformed into who? Into Christ. In their very lives, they're reliving the life of Christ. And here with Stephen, there's an absolute parallel, one after another, about the passion and death of our Lord and the passion and death of Stephen. Okay? They are being totally transformed into him. And what happens? Right away, Stephen's prayer is answered. 
verse 16. Chapter 7, verse 16. He knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting to his death. Now we know who Saul's going to become. He's going to become Paul. He's going to go through a huge conversion very shortly. So immediately Saul's presented in the text because here's the answer to his prayers. His sin is not held against them. In fact, one of the ones that is murdering him is to become one of the greatest Christians ever to live. Okay? Let's keep reading that. Verse 1, keep going. Now Saul was consenting to his execution. On that day, there broke out a severe persecution of the church in Jerusalem, and all were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lament over him. Saul, meanwhile, was trying to destroy the church, entering house after house and dragging out men and women. He handed them over for imprisonment. Okay, so we got that distinction between the region of Judea and Samaria. What's that? What, what's Judea and Samaria? What are they talking about? What's Samaria? What's Judea? Yeah, the north and south. Remember that kingdom was split in half of the Civil War. Okay, it's a good reason why you all, you all have to do that thing again. The kingdom is split in half, right? The northern kingdom became the kingdom of Samaria, and the southern kingdom the kingdom of, of Judea. So they're talking about now the whole promised land. Okay? All right, keep going. Now those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Thus Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. With one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was said by Philip when they heard it, and saw the signs he was doing. For unclean spirits, crying out in a loud voice, came out of many possessed people, and many paralyzed and crippled people were cured. There was great joy in that city. A man named Simon used to practice magic in the city and astounded the people of Samaria, complaining to be so great. All of them, from the least to the greatest, paid attention to him, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. They paid attention to him because he had astounded them by his magic for a long time. But once they began to believe Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, men and women alike were baptized. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, became devoted to Philip. And when he saw the signs and mighty deeds that were occurring, he was astounded. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For it had not yet fallen upon any of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They then laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what's going on there? What can we learn from that text? First of all, they're baptized, and then what happens? And then they're confirmed, right? There seems to be this distinction in the gift of God between baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, not only that, but who's the one that baptizes? Philip is the one that baptizes, and who's Philip? He's one of the deacons, right? Stephen, he's one of the deacons among that group. So he goes down and baptizes, but in order to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit, he has to call for one of the bishops. He has to call for one of the apostles to give the sacrament of confirmation, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So right there we get that initial distinction in the sacraments that the church has always retained. Okay, that baptism and confirmation are two separate sacraments, although intimately related. Intimately related. Okay, in the early church, the distinction between baptism given when you're a child and confirmation given when you're older is, was never the case. Okay, the reason for it was a historical development from this very text. That confirmation was reserved to the bishop. And because the bishop couldn't come for every single baptism... They waited. And so they would baptize the child as an infant, and when the bishop came, he would give them confirmation. Usually as a very young child. But unfortunately, that time period drew further and further apart, and the order of the sacraments, the ancient order of the sacraments, was, in a sense, turned on its head. So that now we started giving 
baptism, right? And then, before the bishop could come and give confirmation, then we would give the Eucharist, and then we would confirm, whereas the ancient order was always baptism, then confirmation, and then the Eucharist. Okay? And this idea of having to separate it by great many years is something born into the early church, and the Roman church is dealing with that right now. And we see many of the writings of the Holy Father, and when this topic comes up among the bishops, there's always a consideration today about moving the years earlier and earlier for confirmation. What are we, why are we waiting so long? It's not a Christian bar mitzvah. Right? Give them the graces as, as children. You might say, well, what do they know? What do they know about confirmation well, as an infant? There is something in church that does it together, right? But they do do it together, yeah. So I am a little biased here. But what do they know about confirmation? I'd say, well, what do we know about baptism? It's a sacrament of God. It's a mystery of God. And we stand with, in the, in the end, we stand with our hands open and say, Lord, I receive your graces. And that's about it. I mean, our, our theology is helpful and things like that, but in the end, we stand before the mystery of God. Yes? I was confirmed two days after my first communion in New York. Yeah. They had it every four years. The bishop would come and started with seven. Right. Seven to eleven. Right. Yeah, and the old, it, right, even probably if some of you were kids, it was given at least like seven or eight years old, right? But today, I mean, California, you might, they wait till you absolutely will reject the faith. Then they start your process of preparing you for confirmation, <laughs> right? So that nobody ever gets confirmed. Okay. That's a little side note for me. Um, and then we can go to verse 14. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, and they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power. Did any one of, of whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit? But Peter said to him, Your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. But don't worry, once saved, always saved. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That's not what it says. All right. Um, no. Uh, so the uh, you know the sin of simony, selling church offices and church church the, the the graces of the Lord. That's where it comes from. Simony from Simon, who tried to buy the sacraments, buy the gifts of God. Okay. Sorry, I had to throw that in one sentence. Okay. All right, um, repent there for verse 22. All right, Carrie, verse 22. Chapter 8? Yes. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours. Pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. Now after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Okay, verse 29. And the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah. And the prophet, uh, sorry, reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you were reading? And he said, Of course I do. All I need is the Bible and the Bible alone. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, those are my two, my two, my two jokes for today. All right, I heard a third joke. You want to know? I got a joke. All right, I got a joke. I heard from my brother, and he, uh, he says, um, says, you know, they did, they did just uh, find the, um, the, uh, they dug up Jericho. You know, they did. You, you heard that? They found Jericho. Like they dug up the, uh, what's it called? Artifact. Yeah, the art, the remains of Jericho. They found out where it was, and um, they actually found one of the trumpets. 
that Israel had used going around the, the most likely Israel had used. Okay, they figure it's a it's a big trumpet, and they um, but it only plays one note. It's an old, I guess, because the old in those days they didn't have all the different notes and stuff. What note do you think it plays? What do you think? B flat. Yeah. B flat. B flat. B flat. <laughs> But um, okay, so uh, I said, Do you understand what you were reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this As a sheep led to the slaughter, a lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken up from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, pray, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? It's the prophet Isaiah. Also, again, remember, context is essential. So going back to the context, the historical context in which Isaiah is writing, all of that to keep that in mind. Then Philip opened his mouth and began, and beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news of, of Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. And Philip and the eunuch, the Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, and the, uh, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at, at Astus, and passing on, he preached the gospel to all the towns till he came to Caesarea. Just to make one comment about that. Um, and that is that does the does the Ethiopian unit call Philip to him and say, Hey, can you help me interpret the text? What happens? He was sent to him, but look, go back. Verse um, Verse 26. But an angel of the Lord said, Rise and go to the south of the road that goes to Jerusalem, to Gaza. This is the desert road. And he, re- he rose and went. And behold, the Ethiopian, and eunuch, and eunuch, and so on, and come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning to him. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah in verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go up to join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? Yeah, I think this is a good lesson for all of us because it's not like God's sitting there telling him, I mean, maybe he did, but I don't think so. Go up, see that guy? Go talk to him and ask him if he understands what he's reading. No. In the spirit, Philip goes, approaches the chariot, and offers the truth about Jesus Christ. In fact, I was just talking to a lady the other day that was, uh, she was in a parking lot, one of our people, she's not here tonight, she was in a parking lot, she saw a car and a lady that had the exact same car she did, but the lady had a cleaner car. So what'd she do? She walked up to the lady and said, said, I see you have the same car that I do. And the lady got out and said, yeah, you're right. She said, but you keep your car so much nicer than mine. And the lady says, oh, well, you know, no, I try to keep it clean, but I always fail. And then so our lady says, says to her, well, you know what I think the most important thing is? That we keep clean our relationship with Jesus Christ. And this lady in the car says, you know, I've just been sitting here in this car and I can't pray. I'm, I'm struggling in my life so much that I've been sitting here and I can't pray. And so she prayed with her. Okay. So what are, the, what are the opportunities given to us in our lives that we could just talk to somebody? Who cares what we say? I say stupid things all the time. No, not you guys know. <laughs> all the time. But just, it's okay. Just do it. Okay? Let the Spirit use you to do the work of the body of Christ. Okay? And you fail one time, try it again. You fail the next time, try it again. As I said to you, airplanes, fantastic. People can't get away from you. You can talk to them, right? The grocery store line, where they have switch lines on you, just keep talking until they walk away. It's okay. Right? Anything, little things, seeing God bless you. You know? When you drive up, when you drive up to the um, to the toll road booth, how many times have you seen a guy sitting there that doesn't have any money? I see it all the time. I don't know. Do you guys take the toll? 
No. Okay. Well, that's the bus. <laughs> but I no, the green way. The green, yeah, the total, the green, yeah, and they're paying it. The guy doesn't have any money. He's sitting there going, oh, what am I going to do now? Give him some money and say, give glory to Jesus Christ and drive away, and that's it. And that's all God wanted you to do that day, and you do that. Okay, anyways, all right. Um, we could talk about some Old Testament stuff with, with the Ethiopian unit, but um, the reason there okay the reason there is Jews that are down in Ethiopia or Ethiopian converts is because during the Babylonian exile you can see this. We're not going to turn to it right now, but if you want to go look it up, um, look at um, uh, 2 Kings chapter twenty five. 2 Kings chapter twenty five, verse twenty six. 2 Kings 25, 26. Okay, and the little read that whole that whole chapter. Don't do it right now. Don't do it right now. Okay, because there's some of the exiles are given a choice to go into exile Babylon or to stay in the Holy Land. And they stay, some of them. And they end up leaving the Holy Land and going down into Egypt. Okay, and so they end up down there near Ethiopia, and that's most likely the reason why we find Jews even that far down uh, in Ethiopia. Okay. All right. Um, oh, perfect. This is fantastic. We're going to conclude with this. You got to give me five minutes because we're all late. Okay. Um, verse. So let's just keep reading. You got baptized, right? We read that? Yeah. We read the whole thing. Fantastic. Chapter 9, verse 1. Go ahead, Terry. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Okay, the one comment about that, the way, that's the reference. In the early church, before Christians were called Christians, they were just called those who followed the way. Okay, and that reference to the way is a reference to Isaiah chapter 40. We're not going to turn there right now, but it's a text you know very well that John the Baptist used on the edge of the Jordan River. And what was that? What is John the Baptist saying on the edge of the Jordan River, quoting Isaiah? Make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. Okay, prepare a road through the desert, is what Isaiah says. It's the story of the return of the Babylonians from exile, not the Babylonians, the Jews, from the Babylonian exile to take the Holy Land back. Okay? And the early Christians understand themselves as the ones returning from the Babylonian exile, being given the kingdom back, finally. If you know, if you know the, the story well, after the Babylonian exile, Israel never really came back to life. It was always under domination. They considered them slaves in their own land. They considered themselves slaves in their own land. Okay, So still there was this yearning for this return from Babylon. And the early Christians see themselves fulfilling that. Okay, the way. All right. Uh, uh, so that so that he found or verse two, and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. This conversion experience of St. Paul is a turning point not only in Acts, but a turning point in all of the New Testament writings that are going to happen. And it's become it will become for us the root when we study St. Paul after Christmas. This verse, this text, will become the root to understanding the theology of St. Paul. Because he has had a life-changing experience. Whatever he saw, whatever he experienced, was so life-changing that it would influence everything he did from this day forward. And what had just happened? Who was he persecuting? He was persecuting the Christians. He was persecuting Jesus Christ. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, 
Lord, what do you mean? I'm, I'm going after all these, all these people. Who are you? He says, I'm Jesus Christ. You're persecuting me when you persecute them. And suddenly in the writings of St. Paul, we find something, a, a theology which is, I would say, foreign up until this point. A realization in St. Paul. And not that it's foreign to what's taking place. We have just seen all this transformation of the people in the image and likeness of God. But suddenly, the understanding of what is happening to them comes to fruition. St. Paul has the vision of what is taking place. St. Paul has the vision of the body of Christ. St. Paul has the vision of Christians as Jesus Christ before him. Okay? I want to look just in two minutes. I want to look at a couple of, of, of things. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 real quick. These are all St. Paul's writings. Which one? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, you know, honestly, this might, take, this might take more than two minutes. It might take three or four. So if you got to go in and understand, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Chapter 5, verse 21. Don't get upset with the whole talk about men and women for now. Let that go. So, so are we going? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands love their wives, should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ in the church. Okay, we've been talking about this in RCI, this very verse. What's the great mystery? Christ in the church. And what is it about Christ in the church that's the great mystery? The union. The two shall become one. The two shall become one. The church is going to become Jesus Christ on earth. That is the mystical body of Christ. It is the mystical body of Christ. Okay? Turn back to chapter 4. Chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. And we're going to finish with this one thing. We could look at other ones too, but we just don't have time. We'll start with it next time again, just as a reminder. Chapter 4, verse nine. 9. First or 4? Ephesians chapter 4, <laughs> verse 9. <laughs> chapter 4, verse 9. Here we go. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended in the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is he who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And his gifts were, were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipment of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Notice the same language. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the cunning of men, by the, their craftiness and deceitful wiles. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. From whom the whole body, this is the most important phrase, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, it makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. Every joint with which it is supplied. The, the parts of the body of Christ are not like, it's not like there's Jesus Christ as the head right here, and then we're all, well, I'm a part of it, so i like this, and you're like that, and you're like that. Not at all. St. Paul sees the body of Christ 
is a head with a real neck and arms and legs. And if I'm a leg, or if I'm a foot and my knee's not doing the job, guess where I'm going? To hell. Salvation depends upon the body of Christ, upon each one of us. If Philip had not walked up to the Ethiopian eunuch, he would not have been baptized. It is our job as the body of Christ to save our fellow men. I don't have a messianic complex or anything like that. It's just that Jesus Christ loves us so much that he doesn't save us by himself. He lets us save our fellow men with him. If we're willing. If we're willing. Our, our, our wives, our husbands, rely upon us for their salvation. Okay? Let's conclude the prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was the beginning, it is now, and shall be world without end. Amen. St. Luke, pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sorry to preach it, you guys.